Ah, beautiful! You're walking with your friend and look up at the sky. The sun looks a bit different today, like it has some kind of ring around it, a rainbow type thing. Huh? Hey, look at that! Your friend pulls his head up out of his phone. You shouldn't look directly into the stop everything, he says. It's a sun halo. We need to find shelter now, unless you have the world's biggest umbrella on you. A sun's halo is nature's sign that there's a snow or rainstorm on its way. It's caused by clouds that are made of bazillions of small ice crystals flying around 20,000 feet. Sunlight goes through those crystals, which causes the light to split and refract, like when there's a rainbow. Now, don't look at the sun halo directly. It's going to be tempting because it's not something you see every day. Plus, it's really beautiful. But ultraviolet light can burn the exposed tissue of your retina and cause serious damage. So, not worth it. Grab some sunglasses, and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts about 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. Nature sends early signs of disasters in many ways. J-shaped trees means there's a landslide coming. Since the ground is moving slowly, the trees grow into the super selfieable shape. Try to find a flat area and avoid going near any trees, unless you have superhuman strength. You're on a nice walk on the beach. Sand, sun, not a cloud in the sky. Then, out of nowhere, you see the ocean going back away from the shore. Suddenly, you can even see bits of coral, small fish, and other random small sea animals. That's a good sign to leave. There might be a tsunami on the way. A tsunami is formed when there's an earthquake underwater, and it can hit the coast at 500 miles per hour. It's mostly a Pacific Ocean thing, but why risk it? If there's a channel of choppy water on the beach, stay away. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes, waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange gap in the waves. Or you might notice random bits of seaweed going in all different directions. If you don't ever find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat and don't waste your energy swimming against the current. Yell out for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the channel, swim diagonally to the shore. If you find yourself in the ocean and see a group of sharks swimming, okay, this scenario doesn't sound good either way. Well, the good news is they're not necessarily coming for you. The bad news? The sharks might be trying to escape from a huge tropical storm or even a hurricane. Sharks can sense these things, so when nature gets angry, they group together and swim deep under the surface to get to safety. You probably shouldn't follow them. Good luck! The golden rule since ancient times, follow the animals. Insects, rats, and snakes leave their homes a couple of days before really big earthquakes. Scientists can't track or really explain how they know it's coming. It seems animals really can sense earthquakes. Maybe because they feel those smaller initial shock waves that we don't even notice. What if you see animals running towards you? Well, that could mean you're about to get eaten for breakfast. Or it means there's a wildfire behind them. Amphibians like frogs, toads, and salamanders try to protect themselves by burrowing down into the ground. Others just run. Before you start running alongside them, check to see if you can see smoke. You don't want to sprint flat out for nothing. Well, it's not just animals. We can spot warning signs, too. For example, if you notice your hair suddenly starts to stand on end and your jewelry starts to buzz, take shelter right away. Lightning might be about to strike somewhere nearby. If you're outside and can't run into a house, make sure not to stand near any tall structures. Lie flat on the ground. Be near water. Seek shelter under an isolated tree or stand in an open space. And don't stand on top of the Empire State Building. That thing gets zapped hundreds of times a year. Do you like skiing? It's all fun and games until all you can see is white. Avalanches can move up to 80 miles an hour. So watch for some warning signs. Does it feel hollow when you walk in the snow? Are there cracks around your feet? Can you see a huge avalanche coming? Time to go! Sometimes a storm mixes its blue light with the red light from the sun, and you get a pretty impressive green. 
Enjoy it from a safe distance, preferably indoors. This super tall thunder cloud usually means you're about to get smashed by hail, or worse, a tornado. Find cover somewhere, like in an underground parking lot or a basement. It might be a bit embarrassing if you're wrong, though. Okay, we know volcanoes can be dangerous, but the lakes near them? Is anything not a sign of danger? Lakes that are near something boiling hot that never cools, so volcanoes, are like wildly shaken soda cans just about to burst. The magma that's underground actually pushes carbon dioxide into the bottom of the lake, and that gas stays there, waiting. Then, even something boring like rain can disturb the lake a little too much and bam! Or boom! (laughs) You get the picture. Diving, swimming, snorkeling, the sea can be amazing, but it's pretty unpredictable. When two wave currents run into each other, they can create a cross sea. It looks pretty cool from far away, but it can be really dangerous for swimmers, surfers, or even ships. There's a strong current roaming around under the surface. You're walking on the beach, apparently every good story starts like this, and all of a sudden, woo, a cave! How cool is this? You should probably go in there, explore a bit, and no. If there's a full moon out, you might not be able to get out of that cave. A full moon affects the tide and makes it lower than usual. That cave might be more accessible, but instead of an exciting adventure, you could end up trapped in there until the next full moon. Bring a big lunch. A wall cloud is one of those things you're both excited and scared to see. Scared because you don't know what it is. Excited because, well, how often do you see something like that? Whatever you feel, tell your legs to start running. During a thunderstorm, these wall clouds sit lower than anything else and can be up to 5 miles long. And if they start spinning, well, Dorothy ended up in Oz. Who knows where you'll end up? It's 2009 in Italy. A man was hanging out in his kitchen. Then he saw some flickering lights. He knew just what to do. He moved his family to a safe place. A couple of seconds later, a massive earthquake hit the whole region. His family survived thanks to his quick reaction. He knew these flickering lights were actually a sign of an upcoming earthquake. People have been seeing these mysterious lights for ages. Some thought it was some kind of sign coming from space. Scientists never used to take them seriously. But after the invention of photography, more and more evidence of these strange lights appeared. Soon, they realized the connection. The lights appear, and pretty soon, the earthquake hits. After a bit of digging around, they actually found some records of these earthquake lights from hundreds of years ago. There were bluish flames coming out of the ground right before an earthquake. Ooh, creepy. Oh, ocean, come on, not you again. Okay, but just one more. If you see the oceans turned all reddish-brown, don't go in the water or anywhere near it. This red tide is caused by toxic algae and is something you can find all over the world. That toxic algae can be there even if the ocean's a normal color. Getting that stuff all over you can cause some health issues. Rinse yourself off in fresh water as fast as you can. You know, they even wrote a holiday song about it. Algae home for Christmas. No, really. So, there you are. You've been driving for hours through the night. You didn't have any chance to sleep, so your mind is hanging by a thread. You stop the car and go out to stretch your limbs. And then, you look up into the sky and see a beautiful sunrise. Whoa, wait! There are three suns in the sky. You rub your eyes, but nope. There are still three bright stars in the sky. Now our home star hasn't been torn into three pieces. Nor has it been visited by two other stars. This is called a sun dog. It occurs mostly during severe frosts. Small ice crystals in the sky bend the light. As a result, you may see three bright spots in the sky instead of just one. This phenomenon is officially called a halo. Usually, it's just a circle around the sun. You can even see a halo at night, too. Just look at a street lamp, and you'll see a bright circle around it. Sometimes, a halo can take on a fancier shape. If there's a lot of ice in the air, the light is warped even more. Just like in a room with a dozen mirrors, then the halo can take on the shape of a human eye. Because of this phenomenon, a false dawn can occur also. 
While you're looking at the horizon, the dawn begins and the edge of the sun appears. A little bit more and… wait! The sun starts to just dissolve in the sky. After a few moments, it's dark again. And only a minute later, the real sun shows its face. It was the same light curvature effect you saw before with the three suns. Only now, the light is curved vertically, not horizontally. And instead of the real sun, its reflection in ice crystals in the sky appeared. But the sun with three stars on the horizon is actually real. Not on Earth, though, but 340 light years away. There's a star system at the center of which lurks a star almost twice the size of our sun. And there are two small stars orbiting around this giant. From afar, they look like dumbbells. This strange world has a planet, too. Sunsets and dawns there really happen with three stars. If you brought your significant other to a park bench to watch a sunset here, your date would go just fine. Whatever that means. Now you're at home, watching YouTube to the sound of a thunderstorm. Suddenly, you hear the sound of a window shattering and all the lights in the house go out. You see a streak of bright blue light from under the door to the next room. You open the door and see a sphere of lightning the size of a basketball. It's hanging still, occasionally zipping tiny lightning bolts to its sides. After a couple of moments, the ball flies away toward the window through which it got here. You've just witnessed a ball lightning. Clever name. Such a phenomenon has been observed in different parts of the world, and each time, it scared people to bits. In 1753, an experienced sailor went up on the deck of a ship. He looked out and saw a big blue ball of fire over the water. The sailors wanted to turn around and catch up with this mystical orb, but it was moving too fast. And before they could change course, the ball flew upward at a tremendous speed. Then there was a powerful explosion, the force of a thousand cannons. The boom tore the top of the ship's mast, and several sailors were thrown back by the shockwave. In the same instant, the orb disappeared, leaving behind only the unusual smell of sulfur. And one recent case occurred in Eastern Europe. During a thunderstorm, a ball of lightning flew into a woman's house. The woman remained motionless, and the blue ball flew right over her head. The lightning then discharged into the electrical wiring inside the wall and disappeared. But despite eyewitness claims, ball lightning still remains an unconfirmed phenomenon. And even if it exists in reality, we can't explain how it appears. Some scientists have even been able to create ball lightning in the lab. But those fears weren't stable, and they weren't anything like what the witnesses described. Moving on. This cloud looks like a dinosaur. And this one looks like a cat. And this one, whew, it looks like these clouds are falling down. Ah, that's just a mammatus cloud. Their shape really makes them look like chunks of clouds about to slam on the ground. Well, that's not going to happen, but you better start seeking cover anyway. Such clouds are a sign of a severe thunderstorm coming. It takes a lot of moist air with ice crystals at the top and dry air at the bottom to create such clouds. Then, vertical currents of air appear between these layers. And these currents make the clouds take the shape of a human brain. <laughs> and this giant cloud looks like a dome that's going to cover an entire city. In fact, that's exactly what happens. A huge cloud covers a large area and then rains heavily on it. Sometimes, the front of such a cloud takes a bizarre shape, like in these pictures. It looks more like several giant spaghetti clouds or even giant cloud worms. This phenomenon can often be seen in Australia, and it's called a morning glory. It happens because a strong wind twists parts of the cloud on both sides, and then the huge sheet of air dough splits into thick strips. And sometimes you can see clouds in the sky made of birds. Wow, that cloud moves quickly and changes shape. It becomes more transparent and then denser and darker again. The birds seem to be involved in some kind of dance or performance. But they're not doing it for beauty or for the crowds of spectators gathered below. They're doing it for protection. When birds group themselves into such a cloud, they intimidate birds of prey. An eagle or hawk would have a hard time picking out a single target among the endless numbers of birds. And they move quickly, covering each other. 
fish are huddled together in schools in the same way. Such a cloud might just spook a hungry predator. For another unusual phenomenon, we'll have to look at the Earth from a bird's eye view, at night. We head to the Middle East. There's a large desert there and it's completely dark, except for one spot. It's a big circle that glows with a bright orange light, the Darvasa crater. And it's just a giant gas burner. Years ago, geologists found gas there, and they started mining for it. But when they excavated, they came across a void underground. The void collapsed, and it formed a crater. It's as wide as half a soccer field and as deep as a five-story building. Gas began to come out of the cracks in the crater. And since animals were often grazing near this place, the gas could harm them. Then the geologists decided to set these gas streams on fire to exhaust the source. One spark, and the crater was filled with columns of fire 30 feet high. Geologists thought the fire would be over in a day or two. But if you come here now, you'll see this gateway to the underworld is still burning. And it's been going on for almost 50 years. In 2013, a man descended to the bottom of the burning crater for the first time. He collected many different samples there, and scientists were able to find bacteria that aren't found anywhere else on Earth. They're quite comfortable at the bottom of this endless burning fry pan. Another mystical phenomenon can be seen in the desert. A sand waterfall. When the wind brings a lot of sand to the edge of the canyon, it begins to fall down. Now amplify this effect a hundred times, and you get a sand waterfall in Saudi Arabia. It really is like Niagara Falls, only there's not a drop of water. The locals say this phenomenon warns of an impending sandstorm. And the last phenomenon can only be seen in winter. You see a frozen river, and there's some strange stones sticking out of the ice. But when you get closer, you can get scared, because it's not a stone, but a crocodile snout. Don't fret, though. It can't jump out from under the ice and take a bite out of you. And the animal isn't in trouble, as you might think. Crocodiles can't breathe underwater, and they need to constantly rise to the surface to take a breath. But when the water freezes, that becomes impossible. So crocodiles stick their noses out before severe frosts and leave half their body on the surface. They can breathe safely. Plus, the ice and cold air cools the crocodiles and slows down their metabolism. So that's how crocs can survive the cold and hungry times. And so this true story about crocs is not a croc. Get equipped for any season with brand new Brightside merch. Click the link and grab your print. Arcturus, a huge red star. It's just bursting from inside out. The red sea of plasma on its surface rages and pulsates. The star burns anything that comes close to it. And now, flop, Arcturus is gone. But at the same moment, it reappears at the center of our solar system, replacing the sun. What we see in the sky isn't a small yellow dot anymore, but a giant red ball. It's 25 times wider and 30% heavier than the sun. Even though Arcturus is a little cooler, it's still a total nightmare for Earth. The distance from our planet to the star is now 25 times less. All the water in the oceans and rivers begins to evaporate. What used to be rainforests are quickly turning into a lifeless desert. But sunsets and sunrises now look amazing. Imagine yourself on the roof of the Empire State Building, watching the sunrise. First, you see the light over the horizon. It almost blinds you, because Arcturus is 110 times brighter than the sun. Then, the star gradually climbs over the surface. The thick dot on the horizon gets wider and wider. It continues to grow, until the red star is everything you can see. Arcturus is now so close that you can even see storms of hot plasma on its surface. There are periodic outbursts and mass ejections. Huge amounts of matter are ejected from the surface of the star at speeds of up to 1,200 miles per second. The matter takes the form of a loop attached to the star at both ends. And you have to wear a super advanced spacesuit to be able to observe such a sunrise. Life on Earth ceased to exist long ago under these conditions, and it's going to get worse over time, because every eight days, Arcturus's brilliance increases, and soon, our planet will become more like Venus, 
It's so close to the sun that the high temperature makes any life there impossible. Okay, let's let our planet cool down a bit and put Proxima Centauri in the center of our solar system. It's not a red giant, but a red dwarf. This star is almost seven times smaller than the sun and almost nine times lighter. Now our oceans and rivers are not evaporating, but freezing over. Forests and jungles are covered with snow. In about a week, there won't be a single place on Earth where the temperature is above freezing. Even plants that are used to the cold will cease to exist. They mostly feed on the sun's energy. Now, they begin to starve. But there will still be water deep beneath the ice layer. It'll be heated by the hot core of our planet. Microorganisms will still be able to survive. It's much darker on Earth, too. It's like an endless twilight here. Oh, and we can barely see the moon. The thing is, it doesn't produce its own light, but reflects it from the bright sun. With Proxima Centauri instead, the moon will lose its brightness. Hop on the bright side of life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. But an even bigger problem would be with our orbit. The sun has a certain gravitational force, and it keeps us just in the sweet habitable zone, where we're not too hot and not too cold. Proxima Centauri's gravity is much weaker, and Earth is slowly drifting away from the star. We now run the risk of encountering asteroids flying through space, or even other planets. But the worst case scenario is if Proxima Centauri simply can't hold our planet, and we fly away into dark space. Then, you can forget about any forms of life here. Now, let's put Sirius at the center of our solar system. It's the brightest star in our night sky. It's only 70% bigger than the sun, but almost twice as hot. So its glow is not only bright, it's sizzling. And its light is not yellow, but somewhere between blue and white. You couldn't go out in the city without sunglasses, or serious glasses. <laughs> Still, you wouldn't want to walk the streets, where the asphalt is boiling anyway. You could literally fry eggs on the curb. Of course, by this time, all life on Earth has long since disappeared. But it's not just because of the temperature. Sirius emits enormous amounts of radiation. Our atmosphere serves as a shield against the sun. But in the case of Sirius, that shield wouldn't be enough. Now, why don't we take a more bizarre approach and make ourselves a double star system? These are two stars that revolve around a common center. And there's our Earth, safe and sound. It's all about the size and brightness of the stars. These two aren't too big, and they give off as much light as our sun. All that matters to us is that our planet is in the safe zone of the double star system. At sunrise, you first see one star appear from below the horizon, and then, a couple of minutes later, the other. The only problem is that this beauty may soon explode with enormous force. In binary systems, one star is always heavier than its companion. Sooner or later, it starts pulling matter away from the smaller star. Gradually, the bigger star just eats its neighbor. Then the big brother can reach a critical mass and explode. This explosion would be about as strong as a supernova. It would destroy our entire solar system. The light from this explosion would be visible for hundreds of light years away. And after that, there would be a huge nebula in the place of our star system. It's stardust and particles that are left from our world. Going to the realm of the crazy now, a black hole. Yes, there's one at the center of our solar system now. We know black holes are scary, mysterious objects that pull in everything in their path. But even around a black hole, there is a habitable zone. You just have to be far enough away so that it doesn't drag you down into its black abyss. Mercury and Venus would be too close to the black hole. So most likely, they'd be torn apart and then head for the event horizon. This is the last stop before hitting the singularity, the heart of the black hole. There are only two problems, light and time. A black hole pulls light in instead of emitting it so the Earth will quickly become dark and cold. And time goes slower around heavy objects. Near a black hole, one second can be equal to weeks or even months away in outer space. 
We won't feel this difference, but the entire universe around us will develop faster relative to us. Any object can become a black hole if it's compressed to a certain size. For example, the sun can become one if it's shrunk to a width of 3.7 miles. And even the Earth, if you squeeze it to a width of 0.7 inches, it becomes a black hole. Oh, now there's some little rock lurking in the center of our solar system. It's a neutron star. It's about 18 miles wide. Some meteorites are much bigger than that. But it has a mass comparable to the Sun. So its gravitational force is about the same, and our planet's orbit is intact. But the problem is that neutron stars emit next to no visible light. So it's now permanent night on Earth. Still, it gets very hot here. When a neutron star is born, it can be several times hotter than the sun at first, but it quickly cools down to the temperature we're used to. So there's a chance that all life on Earth hasn't yet been scorched. Another problem is that these little guys are rapidly spinning and can become pulsars. It's kind of like a powerful spotlight on two sides of a spinning star. Neutron stars also eject radiation at tremendous speeds. These rays will make our planet literally sterile. No life form would be able to exist under these conditions. And now, it's time for the biggest star ever known, Stevenson 218. This red giant is 2,150 times larger than the Sun. And if we place it at the center of our solar system, its edge will lie on Saturn's orbit. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter are already swallowed by the huge star. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are roasting like chestnuts on a fire and will soon evaporate. In fact, this could happen to our Sun as well. The older it gets, the redder and bigger it becomes. It'll eventually run out of its fuel, hydrogen, and the Sun will start to burn heavier elements in its core. This will cause it to expand. Then we'll see more beautiful sunsets and sunrises, but the temperature will become too high. In theory, the sun will get so big that it'll swallow the Earth. And then, it'll explode in a supernova, leaving nothing of our entire solar system behind. Shiny! We're flying past the planets of our solar system. We pass by Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Then we move through dark space beyond the edge of our world. We've reached our destination. It's the Oort Cloud. It's a hypothetical region around the solar system that holds tons of asteroids and blocks of ice. It's likely to be where the largest comet in human history was born. And now, it's heading toward the Sun. Bernardinelli Bernstein was discovered totally by accident during the Dark Energy Survey. Our telescopes were pointed at distant space. Their main goal was to learn more about how the universe was expanding. Astronomers also wanted to make a more detailed map of the observable universe. Scientists analyzed over 80,000 images and found a moving object. It was alarmingly close to our home planet. Its size was an impressive 62 miles. That's about the width of Lake Michigan. It was an already active comet with a long tail. Usually, comets get a tail when they come close to the sun. The heat from the star warms the comet's surface, and light materials, like ice, begin to evaporate. This forms a cloud of steam and dust that stretches far beyond the comet. But Bernardinelli Bernstein is too far away from the sun to start heating up. This means that its surface has a different composition. It might be solid carbon monoxide. This increases the luminosity of the comet. That's why it can be observed with telescopes on Earth. We can compare Bernardinelli Bernstein to the largest meteorite to ever fall on Earth. About 66 million years ago, our planet was hit by a meteorite about 6 miles wide. At that time, the blast wave from the collision went around Earth several times. Tsunami waves caused by the impact were taller than the largest skyscrapers, and the energy from the explosion set huge areas on fire. Almost all living creatures, including dinosaurs and ancient fish, ceased to exist. The meteorite left a crater three times the size of Manhattan. The place where it fell was rich in sulfur. This substance evaporated because of the abnormal heat and gathered into massive clouds. This caused acid rains that were falling on Earth for several more weeks. 
Our newly discovered comet is 10 times bigger. If it were flying toward Earth, you'd see it with the unaided eye long before the impact. It looked like a moving star in the night sky. A few days before the comet reached our planet, you'd see it even during the day. You'd be able to distinguish its long tail, too. When the comet entered the atmosphere, it'd produce a booming sound so loud you'd hear it on the other side of Earth. At this point, the comet would begin to heat up because of friction with the air. It'd start burning. Countless pieces of debris would break away from the main body of the meteorite and fall to Earth. As soon as Bernardinelli Bernstein touched the surface of the planet, we'd see a flash so bright it'd outshine the sun. In a fraction of a second, a colossal amount of energy would be converted into heat. This would create the most powerful explosion in the history of our planet. It'd literally rip out chunks of ground and throw them into the air. The blast wave would incinerate everything within a few hundred miles. It continued to spread in different directions, breaking and bending trees. At one point, it reached snow-capped mountains and trigger huge avalanches that would cover many villages. The blast wave would go around the planet, shattering glass and buildings on all continents. Tsunami waves would be so high they would cover entire coastal cities. The most powerful earthquake in history would break the ground and create deep cracks. After the impact, billions of tons of dust and ash would rise into the air. A giant black cloud would completely block the sun's rays. Earth would be plunged into darkness. All the debris in the air would start melting. They'd turn into liquid lava and fall back to the surface, causing even more damage. The ash and dust in the air would cover the sun for several more months. During this time, the temperature on Earth would drop by several degrees. Even if they were hiding in deep shelters and bunkers, people, as well as all other living organisms on the planet, would be unlikely to survive this event. Fortunately, Bernardinelli Bernstein isn't going to approach Earth. Right now, the comet is about 20 astronomical units away from the Sun. That's 20 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. It means the comet will soon cross the orbit of Uranus. In 2031, it'll be 11 astronomical units away from our star. That's just outside Saturn's orbit. This is going to be the closest Bernardinelli Bernstein will approach the Sun then it will begin its flight back to the edge of the solar system. But the comet is bound to return again. It'll move away from the sun and slow down until the star's gravity pulls it back. Then the comet will make another circle around our solar system, but that will take about three million years. Right now, we have other meteorites to worry about. For example, 3200 Phaedon. It crosses the orbits of Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury. Then it goes around the sun and comes back. This cycle takes about 523 days. Then it starts over again. This meteorite is considered potentially hazardous because it crosses Earth's orbit at 7.5 Earth-Moon distances. During one of its last approaches to Earth, this 3.6-mile wide block of rock showered our planet with small meteors. Since the asteroid often passes by the sun, its surface is most likely to look like the dry bottom of a mud swamp. It's covered in scales and cracks. As it flies past Earth, these scales break off and cause meteor showers. But the largest, potentially hazardous asteroid is the 1999 JM8. It's about the size of 77 soccer fields. It passes by Earth at nine lunar distances. Its closest approach to our planet will happen in August 2137. If such a meteorite were to hit Earth, an entire continent could be wiped out. The rest of the world would experience massive tsunamis, but would survive the event. So naturally, scientists are thinking of ways to protect the planet from such a disaster. The first solution is a controlled Big Bang. One of the laws of physics says that if you apply some force in one direction, it'll cause a reaction in the opposite direction. So if we spot an asteroid that is about to collide with Earth, we'll need to send a rocket toward it. This way, we'll produce a controlled explosion, not inside, but right above its surface. The blast will be directed upward, and the asteroid will shift downward. Even this tiny shift would be enough to change the trajectory of the asteroid, and then it'll fly past Earth. Another way is to send a heavy object, like a spaceship, toward the space body. Every heavy object has its own gravity, so the spacecraft will have to fly close to the asteroid 
which will attract the ship to its surface, but the engines of the spacecraft will resist. The ship will start pulling the asteroid in the opposite direction. This will change the trajectory of the asteroid, and our planet will remain intact. We can also ram the asteroid with the spaceship. Bam! Or, we could build a space station, like the ISS. It would be equipped with a bunch of huge magnifying lenses. We would send the station closer to the sun and start looking for potentially hazardous asteroids. Then, we'd point all the lenses so that the sun's rays would focus on the giant rock. The heat would begin to vaporize the matter from the asteroid's surface. That's where physics would come into play again. The matter would evaporate upward, and the asteroid would move downward. We could also wrap the asteroid in a reflective film, something like foil. Usually, space bodies absorb most of the sun's rays, but if the asteroid was covered in foil, the rays would bounce off its surface. This would create a weak pushing force. That should be enough to avoid the collision. Of course, we could attach rocket engines to the asteroid. This way, we would be able to not only change its trajectory, but also control it. But that would depend on the size of the asteroid and the number of engines. And then, we could use this massive rock to ram it into other, larger asteroids. This is Neptune. The next stop is Pluto. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. One day, with top-notch future technologies, one stop from Neptune to Pluto won't seem much further than Times Square from Bryant Park today. There are huge ice mountains on Pluto, valleys that go further than your eyes can see, 160-mile large craters, almost as big as the largest one on Earth, and no life. The reasons are obvious. The long distance between Pluto and the Sun guarantees freezing temperatures on that dwarf planet. It also ensures a trip of a few billion miles. Plus, it's smaller than the Moon, so it would get crowded very soon if people started dwelling there. Still, there's one reason which makes life there not that far-fetched. The Sun has a lifespan and cycles within it. Our solar system used to be nothing but a cloud of gas and dust. As a result of a gravitational collapse at the center of this cloud, the gas and dust started gathering in specific, denser places. These pulled more and more matter as time went on, and something called conservation momentum made the mass start rotating and heating up because of immense pressure. Later, there appeared a disk similar to what Saturn has, but it was made of entirely different substances. And right in the center, there was the ball that eventually became the Sun. A protostar is a young star that's still gathering its mass, and that's exactly what the Sun was before the temperatures and pressures inside of it lighted up its core. Millions of years later, it became the Sun we see every day. But it won't stay this way forever. It will heat up even more and eventually get bigger and denser, turning into a red giant. It may one day get big enough to swallow up Venus and Mercury. Chances are, it might swallow even planet Earth. Even if it doesn't devour our planet, the sun might get close enough to touch us. Well, if this happened, life on Earth wouldn't be possible. But then, in just a few minutes, the sun loses about 40% of its mass and shrinks about 10 times what it used to be. It's not as bright and, indeed, not as hot as it used to be. By this moment, Earth will have already been deserted. People might want to start traveling around space or settle down on another planet where life is sustainable, like the exoplanet Kepler-62f, which, by the way, is even bigger than Earth. While all of this was happening, Pluto was changing. Before, every resource was frozen inside of the dwarf planet. Water, gases like methane, carbon monoxide, you name it. But as the sun was reaching its peak luminosity, Pluto was slowly warming up and losing a lot of what it had to the vastness of space. At the same time, an atmosphere formed up. If the atmosphere gets thick enough, it would create favorable life conditions. Then, instead of spaceships, a tiny percentage of us would be able to set up colonies on the dwarf planet. The temperature is comfortable there, almost t-shirt weather. It even resembles Earth a tiny bit. Canyons filled with water, beautiful endless fields with trees, and lots of space to run around. And mineral water pockets on the ground, good enough to drink. Pluto's rotations are different than Earth's. An Earth day is 24 hours, and sometimes it still feels like it never ends. But on Pluto, a whole rotation around the Sun takes 153 hours, because it's pretty far away from the Sun. 
After several hours without sleep, we get tired and our eyes get red. It means we'd have to take several naps throughout the day on Pluto. A year on Pluto equals 248 Earth years. Unless we come up with some sort of technology to get us to live that long, our entire lifespan would be less than half a year on the dwarf planet. So, houses on Pluto might need to be equipped with cryo chambers. Whenever you feel like dreaming for a long time, you jump in it and wake up 50 Pluto days later. On the dwarf planet, there are also seas and beaches. So it's just like a tiny Earth, far away from the actual Earth. The food on Pluto could be tastier. We might find a way to make the ingredients more savory and even try to grow them faster during the trip. You plant a carrot, and two days later, it's ready to be in your salad. There could also be new ingredients for our salads on Pluto. Maybe two meter tall mushrooms we've never seen before. The animals we would take with us on the trip would get released into their new home forever. And with time, they would evolve and adapt to their new environments. The law of the jungle could change a bit too. Lions might not be kings anymore. Deer are. Their antlers are twice the size of what they used to be. But to be fair, so are the deer. Most of the animals that were already here used to live underwater. But with time, the amphibians started shifting to the surface, just like Earth at the beginning of life. Pluto could only be a temporary home though. Once the sun has finally reached its final phase, Pluto would get frozen and lifeless again. People instead would need to try to find a planet that stays in the Goldilocks zone of another galaxy. The Goldilocks zone is the exact proper distance from the star like the sun, where the temperature is perfect for the water to stay liquid. It's the rule scientists search for when looking for other planets that can sustain life. We can try setting new colonies on one such planet, or even try to set up our own artificial home. Not exactly a planet or a spaceship, but a combination of both. Something huge built right in space, say a wheel with gravity everywhere we go so we don't fall off. It would float in space toward the new exoplanet, capable of fitting entire states in. This whole trip might happen just because the sun first grew too much, and then, having reached the culmination of its life cycle, it would finally become a white dwarf. It's gonna be a pretty long journey, and entire generations will be born here. You'll have a choice, sleep your way through the journey until humans finally reach their new exoplanet, or enjoy the trip in this fantastic spaceship. There's all you need on board, malls bigger than those on Earth, large futuristic cities, even places to farm, fields with rich soil made artificially, and finally, after a long journey, the exoplanet. It's even somewhat better than Earth. The planet is giant and has more continents. The continent's center isn't as far from oceans, which means there aren't as many desert areas. Though the sun of this planet is an orange dwarf, it's not as hot as our yellow dwarf sun today. It's a bit smaller, but here's the kick. Orange dwarfs live somewhat longer. They remain stable for between 15 billion and 45 billion years. Despite that, this new planet is full of rainforests because the planet itself is warmer. It means more biodiversity and creatures we've never seen before. But even if nothing out there is suitable, we could try and terraform this planet instead. If we take Mars as an example, we could create a greenhouse effect by smashing ice-rich comets and releasing ammonia in them, making the planet warmer. We could also start planting trees. We'd probably need some Earth soil to do that, or we'd have to modify Mars's soil to be similar to ours. Sooner rather than later, the atmosphere would be close to the one we have on Earth. We'd be able to breathe too, because of the trees. Then, we can melt Mars's polar ice caps and voila, water. The problem is the solar winds and sun explosions that might strip it of an atmosphere just as quickly as we can create one, if not faster. It has no magnetosphere either, which means it can't protect us from radiation. So long-term Mars wouldn't be a good choice. Maybe out there in the vastness that is space, there is a perfect planet waiting for us.